Hey everybody and welcome back to AI 101. We spent the last couple weeks on this channel talking about surveillance and AI related invasions of privacy, so I thought that it would be nice for this month's AI 101 to focus on how we can use algorithms to ensure our privacy instead of have it invaded by others. We're going to focus on two popular methods called differential privacy and federated learning. And stay tuned for the end of the video where I'm going to go through a coding tutorial that you can try at home yourself. If you're new here, I'm Jordan and I'm a PhD student at Harvard and MIT. I have a whole playlist on the basics of artificial intelligence called AI 101, so you should check that out if you're interested. And if you like this video, you can let me know by giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to my channel. So when it comes to protecting user, in this case your, privacy when developing machine learning algorithms, there are two broad approaches that you can take. You can focus on protecting the data well before it enters the model, or you can focus on building security into the model itself. Differential privacy handles the former, and federated learning handles the latter. Let's start with differential privacy. Let's say we're tracking a bunch of people's fitness data on their smartphones. Stairs climbed, calories burned, and more. Our goal is to be able to share information about that data set with other people without revealing the identities of specific people that we're tracking in the process. In more mathematical terms, we have a data set DN and we want to be able to share information about the patterns present in that data set. However, we know that someone is trying to figure out whether a specific person's information is in that data set and we can't let that happen. So we want to create a function f so that the output of this function applied to the entire data set and the output of this function applied to the whole data set minus that one person are as similar as possible. Specifically, we want the probability distributions of these two outputs to be related by a factor called epsilon. The number that you choose for epsilon reflects how private you'd like the data to be. For example, if epsilon is equal to zero, then the distributions of the outputs are exactly the same and you've achieved peak privacy. However, Epsilon doesn't determine how your function makes the data private, you have to do that yourself. There are a lot of ways to create that function, but a common first approach is to add random noise to your data. By doing this, you can keep the distributions of the two data sets roughly the same and ensure privacy. However, the more noise you add, the less accurate the information that you're sharing becomes. In other words, if epsilon is equal to zero, even though you've achieved peak privacy, You've done it at the expense of adding so much noise that the output of your function isn't useful anymore. So where might differential privacy come in handy? Medical data. In the US, medical data is considered protected health information under a regulation called HIPAA, which means it can't be shared unless it's been sufficiently anonymized or unless the person whose data it is has given permission for it to be shared. As a quick aside, the standard for anonymization of data under HIPAA doesn't actually make your data anonymous. There's been a lot of studies that have shown that you can in fact re-identify people from their anonymized health data fairly easily. Differential privacy is a potential approach that hospitals and large medical centers can use to share information about their patient data without actually sharing the patient data itself. In fact, I actually worked on this for a little bit during a rotation when I started my PhD in the MIT Media Lab. However, differential privacy only really works if you have a data set that's large enough to be able to make the data private while still being able to pull useful information from it. If your data set's too small, you may either make the data private at the expense of making it unusable, or be able to recover the patterns that you're interested in sharing at the expense of making it fairly easy to identify the patients that you're sampling from. Okay, so what if you don't wanna to have to deal with protecting the data itself? Then you might turn towards federated learning instead. Unlike differential privacy, federated learning doesn't focus on changing the data itself. Instead, it focuses on training an algorithm across multiple separate data sets without sharing information between the data sets themselves. So let's say you're still tracking that fitness data, but now you want to predict someone's fitness performance the next day based on the data from the days past. This is a product that already exists for the record. However, you can't pull their data together. Each person's data must remain on their own device. Instead, you develop your model in the cloud and send it to each person's phone. The model is trained on their device and a copy of all the trained models are then transmitted back to the cloud to be compiled into one large model. Depending on your goals, you might send copies of the global model back to each user's device to be incorporated into their personalized ones for better generalization. At this point, you've used federated learning to create a pretty good global model without ever having seen the data that your model was trained on. 
You've also developed models that are specific to each user, potentially improving individual performance compared to the global model itself. Where might federated learning come in handy? Well, if you have an iPhone, you're already reaping the benefits of it. One of the complaints about Siri early on, and a current complaint about Amazon Alexa, is that it wasn't able to distinguish the voice of the person who owned the phone from everyone else. Anybody could go up to your phone and trigger Siri using the trigger words because Siri couldn't tell whose voice was whose. Apple fixed this issue by using federated learning to locally train Siri on your phone to recognize the way that you speak and distinguish it from other people. At the same time, improving their global model with the more general characteristics of how you talk. More broadly, federated learning is useful anytime you have distributed data sources that you either need or want to keep separate for whatever reason. Okay, the part you've been waiting for. How can you try this at home? Well, I've created a Google Collab notebook that you can run on any computer. Google Collab allows you to write programs and run them without having to use the resources from your own computer. In fact, you can use GPUs that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. It's a great way to try your hand at some of the topics that we've covered in past AI 101 videos. So if you're interested, definitely check them out. Also, this video isn't like sponsored by Google or anything. I just think that they're a great resource. So from the top of this notebook, we begin by importing a data set. This data set is publicly accessible using scikit-learn and contains breast cancer data from about 500 patients. In the first section, you experiment with differential privacy to see how changing epsilon affects the accuracy of your predictions. And in the second section, you can see what a federated learning model looks like using PySift and train one yourself. I don't usually do coding demos for these videos, so if you think that that would be useful to have in future AI 101 videos, let me know in the comments. The notebook itself contains a more in-depth explanation of the different coding libraries that I'm using and why I'm using them. So if you have any questions about that, you can also let me know in the comments. Otherwise, if you like this video, you can let me know by smashing that like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also support me on Patreon. Thank you so much to all of my current patrons. Otherwise, you can find me by Googling my name on most social media platforms, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.